Good afternoon. Today, I will talk to you about the war of browsers. This will be a comprehensive case study. We'll put together a lot of parts of the material that we have done in the course, and I hope you will find it very interesting. So uh, we'll talk about the internet. The internet was around from the mid 80s. However, till the beginning of 90s, it was a very different place from what we know today. Mostly, it was a collection of text documents about research. So it didn't have nothing of general interest. And most importantly, the notion of the web page, like I have a web page where people visit and they get information about what, what I need, uh, it was not there any, uh, back then. So no one knew what a web page uh, it was. But uh, the most important problem was that there was no general interest in the internet. Only academics and people that they were doing research or they were interested in getting research results, they would be able to go on the internet and find some, some use of it. In 1993, an undergrad student, maybe a little bit younger than you, Mark Andreessen from the University of Illinois, decided to change that. He put together a team of other students and they wanted to proceed to a project that would change the form of the internet. Till then, the internet was very primitive. If you want to download something, you have to know the physical address. You have to write the physical address on, the, on your FTP client, as they used to call it back then, and then the file would download to your computer and you could open it with the appropriate program. Andreessen, had a very different idea. He said that we should have one program that should have this point and click application, meaning that you don't need to know the address, you just click at a specific place and then you download the file, but you don't need to get out of this client in order to open it. The client would open it once you click on the file. So you click somewhere and then this thing that, that now is named a page, a web page, comes out on your face and you are able to go there and then from there there can be other links that they can lead you in a situation of uh, remind you of surfing where you get like each wave one after another and you can you can uh, proceed with information so they created this application they put the, the software together under the umbrella of the research department of university of illinois and they named this program the mosaic so this was uh, the first internet browser. The application was put on the, on the University of Illinois domain and started downloaded by people. They, in the beginning, they sent an email with a, a link for the application to 100 people. And after a few months, 1 million, uh, 1 million downloads had been done for Mosaic, which was pretty impressive. Probably the first thing to go viral on, on the internet back then. Now, uh, a year later, an entrepreneur, a Silicon Valley guy, uh, who was very smart and he would understand what is, what is going on in the industry, he started seeing potential in this thing. So he didn't even know what it was, but he saw that a lot of people want it. And if a lot of people want something, this is a very good opportunity to make money of it. So Jim Clark, this guy, no, no, not this guy, that guy. So Jim Clark decided to create a firm and take Mosaic into a commercial level, to, to make a product out of Mosaic that people could buy, have customer service, know how it works and everything. And this would be a very nice product that he could find a way to make people pay for it. Now, of course, they could not use the Mosaic code because of copyright restrictions. Uh, University of Illinois had the copyright of that, even if they created it. Uh, and therefore, they proceeded by creating a, a newer and faster version. They named this new project, they, they actually created an organization and they, they named it Mozilla. And uh, this came from, uh, uh, this nickname came from Mosaic and Killa, like the killer of, of Mosaic. Now, in 1994, they, they launched a program from, from Mozilla, and this program was Netscape Navigator. Netscape Navigator was the first commercial browser that people could actually pay and buy, and uh, it, was, it was an iconic product 
of the 90s. It had like a very cool logo and people really loved it. Like back then, you have to understand that, that uh, in 1996, when, when I got my first computer and I, I, uh, I went on the internet, the internet was, was so different than today. Like you had to connect to the internet uh, through, through the phone and, and then you have to keep the line busy. And then your mom was like, Cosmos, who is on the phone? I want to call your aunt. And this would go on like, like all the time. And she would, once she would pick up the other phone, the, the connection will go down. And we didn't say that I'm going on the internet. We said I'm going on, on Netscape. So Netscape connected its name with the internet. It was, it was an amazing product that uh, uh, people really loved. No one had any complaint from, from Mosaic back then. So within one year, this company that was put together with a budget of $5 million. So Jim Clark put like $5 million into this project. And within one year, the company was worth Two billion dollars and this was the one that kick-started the dot-com bubble it was exactly at that time in 1994 that Microsoft was getting ready to release a new version of Windows Windows 95 and this was one version of, of Windows that was supposed to be very different than the previous one and uh, this this product was was um, anticipated uh, from from all people as something that would be a game changer, which which it was, and it was back then when Microsoft realized that in this new operating system that they would create, they had forgotten something important. They had forgotten that internet was now something that people really liked. The uh, internet was something that changed the information technology 100%. And, and they realized that they didn't have this into their package. Anecdotal evidence suggests that once Bill Gates attended a computing expo and he stumbled upon the kiosk of Netscape Navigator. And it was then when he realized what Microsoft had forgotten to put into, into the new operating system. And uh, people who were there, they say that, that Bill Gates just immediately realized the potential and he stood there and he was just staring at the kiosk, trying to understand how Microsoft should get out of this very difficult position. Microsoft executives understood that they had to take action. They invited Netscape people into a meeting and this was a notorious meeting that people from Microsoft, they remember it as if it was a nice gathering and get together to get to know each other, while people from Netscape, they remember it as if it was the worst nightmare. So they, uh, Microsoft made them an offer, an offer that people from, from Netscape, they, they didn't really like it and they try uh, to buy a part of the company, like, like to make a, a long story short, that's what they, they, they were trying to do. Uh, Jim Clark, the, the, practically the, the owner of the, of the, and the CEO of Netscape denied, he, he threw the money into, into Microsoft's face and Microsoft understood that this was not the best way to go. So they rushed to University of Illinois, they licensed the Mosaic code, they had a few months to, uh, to be able to put together another program their own and they created the program that you probably know, maybe some of you have used, uh, the Internet Explorer. So they took Internet Explorer and they bundled it into Windows 95 without charge. So it was a, a, a program that was bundled into the operating system uh, at no charge, at no extra cost. Now, this was not all the story from Microsoft. Microsoft decided to go into a bloody war with Netscape for domination of the browser's market. Why did Microsoft care about browsers so much? Like they, they would give them at no charge anyways. Microsoft understood that the company who can control the internet and the browser was the face of the internet would have unlimited power in the future. So this was a, a war that they wanted to win. Also, 
Netscape Navigator people became very cocky. Mark Andreessen, in one interview that he gave back then, he said that uh, Microsoft is a trash company, that Microsoft is not is going down, that Microsoft will not exist in, in five, ten years, will be just a bunch of, of obsolete program drivers that, that you put together. And people from Microsoft didn't really like how cocky uh, Netscape became. And they said, okay, if these guys have the internet, then the next step is that they make their own operating system and then they will challenge our market, the market which we make our money. So they, they really cared in this battle. Now, once Microsoft puts in money in war, you know that there will be blood. And this is exactly what happened. So they started to use any means possible, honest or dirty, in order to be able to fight Netscape. So how did they decide to do that? First of all, with vertical restraints, agreements of exclusivity. They went to their partners, to, to companies that they were selling computers that they were using uh, the Windows operating system, and straight up told them that if you pre-install Netscape Navigator in these computers, we will cancel your Windows license. Now, canceling the Windows license of a computer seller a computer manufacturer, this was as if you're telling them you are going out of business. Okay, so there was like so harsh politics that they went into this game. The second is that they went to the ISPs, the internet service providers, and they decided to, to they found means to make them to not support Netscape Navigator as good as Internet Explorer. So they, they demanded for them that they will make their services more friendly, friendlier to Internet Explorer than to Netscape Navigator. Now, uh, what happened was uh, inevitable. First of all, Internet Explorer was free. Its market share, share started going up very quickly and the, mar the market share of Netscape Navigator started declining very, very quickly, even though clearly from the user standpoint, the Netscape Navigator was a much superior a piece of software than Internet Explorer ever was. So uh, soon Netscape deteriorated uh, and uh, in 1998 it was acquired by a much less cool company, American Online, AOL. So Netscape was, as a program, was discontinued in 2008. However, this is not the end of the story. Microsoft indeed crashed Netscape because Netscape became very cocky and they didn't do that however without facing some serious cost. In 1998 exactly at the moment where in Microsoft they were celebrating crashing Netscape the United States Justice Department filed one of the biggest antitrust actions in history. They clearly said that Microsoft violated the Sherman Act by engaging into uncompetitive practices, taking advantage of its dominant position in the market of operating systems to monopolize the, another market, the market of browsers, and also they did what we, we have learned, predation. So uh, this was a huge lawsuit. Microsoft was terrified uh, uh, from this happening because this, this was a, a situation that went into the news. Like it became a very big deal, not only in the United States, everywhere in the world. Even though Microsoft put massive resources into this legislative battle, unfortunately for them, they lost. And the decision of the court was devastating. The court ruled that the company has to be broken into two pieces. One piece would be the company that would provide, that would create the operating system and maybe it can have a monopoly if no other firms are interested in producing a, a good operating system like uh, Windows was considered back then to be. And then the other would be the one that would uh, produce all these different applications like uh, browsers, like media players and everything else that is not a, a part of the operating system as, as the court back then ruled. In 2001, Microsoft appealed 
and fortunately for them the court ruled that they didn't have to break into two pieces anymore but they still found guilty and they had to pay uh, 750 million dollars into damages to American Online who was owning uh, Netscape uh, to that point. Uh, from American Online perspective this was the only money that, that they got for their investment so they paid 4.2 million to buy Netscape and uh, the only thing that they got out of this was the 750 million of damages that Microsoft had to pay. On the other hand, and this is one of the most important decisions of the court, Microsoft was forced to share its operating system interface with third party developers. So if you were creating a browser, Microsoft had to give you the same information that for the operating system that their developers would have as if they were creating the Internet Explorer. And this holds like if you create anything that Microsoft is, is also creating an, an application for the same, for the same platform. Now, uh, this might seem like a, a partially happy ending, but it's not the end. Uh, the end is pretty ironic because the final act that the executives of Netscape did before they give the keys to American Online um, was pretty legendary. What they did was that they transferred all the code of Netscape Navigator to Mozilla, to the mother company, to, 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 to the mother uh, organization who was a non-profit back then, and they open sourced the code. This gave birth to a new wave of independent projects that eventually killed Internet Explorer. One of them was Firefox that was created by, it was an open source code by, by Mozilla. And then the other one was that it gave birth to eventually to Google who created Chrome that today has a dominant market share in this market. Now, before we finish this, uh, we have to be fair. And this is our duty as scientists to be fair and to have non-prejudice. Uh, one more thing that I need to tell you is that this trial had a very deep impact in Microsoft. Uh, a lot of people in my generation will remember Bill Gates back then to be the devil of, of this particular market. He was like a particularly hated person. After the verdict came out and after some very embarrassing moments from this trial that they were televised and, and you can find them uh, in YouTube if you are interested, you will see that Bill Gates changed a lot, changed deeply as a character. First of all, he quit as CEO, uh, he left the company and now he's doing only uh, non-profit and, and uh, uh, charity work, which is uh, uh, something that really has an impact in the planet, like the guy is doing a very serious job in, in changing things, in solving problems in Africa, in countries that they need. So no one can actually blame him from that. He, he, he pays billions every year for, for charity. But there is something else that we have to address. How wrong was Microsoft in its claims to the court? Apart from being obviously wrong in the predatorial side for pursuing exclusivity, for pushing the partners of Microsoft to kill any relationship that they had with Netscape. Apart from this, Microsoft argued some very good points. So Microsoft, back in the 90s, where 99% of the people didn't know what the internet was, they claimed that that's the future, that in the future, in the near future, you cannot have an operating system that doesn't have a browser integrated into it. This was very important. Today, we know that this is 100% true. Microsoft was also accused for predation. Was there predation? Yes, there was. But how intense predation is, was something that the court overestimated. And this is because from the model that we saw in the lecture about networks, we understand that when you have a network effect 
competition becomes tippy, competition becomes aggravated. So why it might seem as a predatorial behavior might be due to the network facts in the end, to the network effects. Okay, so it, it was not as predatorial, this behavior of Microsoft was not as predatorial as it appeared at court. A third point is that Microsoft was accused for its uh, intention to exploit the browser market. It never did. It gave its browser for free. It keeps giving it for free even today. Now, the, the browser of, of Microsoft Internet Explorer is not, is not very useful. Uh, actually, it's only used to be able to, to get on a new computer and download Chrome. But the point is that today it is clear that browsers are not meant to be standalone products. So all serious browsers, they are given in, uh, uh, with other products or they are given totally for free for download. Finally. Another point that we have to make from this story is that uh, sometimes the courts, they are not able to foresee the future and they are not able to understand deeply these people that they are in the center of development of specific industries. In 2004, Microsoft was brought into the European court for a very similar case, the case that was bundling the media player, the, the, the media player that they offered with Windows, and this was perceived as, a, as an antitrust issue for the European Union. Again, Microsoft made the claim that you cannot have an operating system that does not incorporate media, that is not integrated with a, a media player. And today, we very well understand that this is a valid point. So this is our case study. We'll have more videos soon.